For those who don't know me yet, my name's Kirk, or if you've only met me with a mask on, which, you know, happens a lot these days. Uh, my name's Kirk Gensel. I'm, I'm new here on staff at H&W, and I'm glad to be with you here today. I'm listening backstage to Darren pray, and it just dawns on me, and I'm reminded today of the fact that the generosity of this church has been an answered prayer to a lot of people over the last months dealing with this pandemic. And I think we should all be reminded from time to time that God uses his people to answer the prayers of the desperate and needy in our world. And that's a beautiful thing that we get to participate in. So before I jump into the sermon, I just wanna say thank you, church, for being generous through a difficult season financially for a lot of us. Thank you for loving the world well during this time. And I just wanna encourage you to continue to be generous. Uh, if you can, because we still have work that needs to be done. So today, if you want to give, you can give at hnw.org forward slash give. You can download the app and do so there. And I just want to encourage you in that and tell you one more time, thank you for that. If you have a Bible today, turn to Luke chapter 10. We're going to be in verse 25 through 37. This is a familiar passage you'll know when we get there, if you don't know already. Uh, one of my favorite passages in Scripture but before, there, before we go there, I want to read you a quote from the late, great Carl Perkins. Uh, those who don't know, Carl Perkins wrote Blue Suede Shoes, a song made famous by Elvis. And he said this in one of his songs, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country from me. Now, listen, I suppose he's right. Yeah, I spent my entire childhood running away from who I am in so many ways. I listened to bands like Smashing Pumpkins and Pearl Jam and Foo Fighters and Switchfoot instead of Garth Brooks and Shania Twain and George Strait, like all my peers. I didn't think that was cool, so I didn't do it. I intentionally never owned a pair of cowboy boots, instead opting for... Uh, Doc Martens and Nikes, that was like my thing. I thought it was cool, and I didn't want to be a country kid, even though I grew up in the Texas Panhandle. I didn't want to be a country kid. We called those kids kickers, and some of you know what that means. But here's the truth I've learned over and over again as I've grown up. I am a country kid, whether I like it or not. Listen, my great-great-grandparents literally brought the cotton gin to Texas. That's pretty country, I would say. Uh, I grew up across the street from a literal farm. Like, not, it was in the same community, but like across the street was a Milo and wheat farm. And my parents' best friends growing up were the owners of that farm. In the summer, I worked on that farm from time to time, helping our neighbor across the street again, Bob, work on irrigation and a myriad of other things. I'm pretty country when it comes down to it. I went to college and I was really into music. And I thought like, I'm gonna be the next John Foreman. I'm gonna write songs like Switchfoot and we're gonna rock and roll all over this town in Abilene. But it turns out that every time I wrote a song, it was country. I couldn't escape it. It was just a part of who I am. Even to this day when I put together words on a page to write a song, it always comes out country. I can't even tell you why other than the fact that it's just a part of me. Uh, when we moved to Austin uh, several years ago, I'll just never forget that the, there was a guy on staff with me. Every time I said the word, the letter I, or referred to myself, he said, I, and I was like, Ross, what's the deal, man? Why are you being such a jerk? And he's like, you can't speak correctly. The letter is I. And I'm like, yeah, that's right, ah. And he's like, no, listen. And here's the thing, I can't say anything correctly because I grew up in the panhandle. I can't escape it. We muddle words together that shouldn't go together. Sometimes three or four that make up one word, and that's just who I am. See, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. My journey as a country boy has been one that showed me how we can be immersed in something and not even know it. See, I had to come out of the country to find that out. The late and tragic uh, David Foster Wallace has a story uh, that describes this phenomenon, not just in country boys, but in all of us. Here's how the story goes. It's about fish in a fishbowl. Here's what he says. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning, boys, how's the water? 
And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the heck is water? See, like the fish mentioned in the story, we too find ourselves swimming in our own immersions. This is often what makes the work of introspection really, really difficult. Self-awareness is hard. When all you've known is water, it's difficult to notice that you've been swimming in it. It's just the way things are. I didn't know I was country until I wasn't in the country. So we're in a series right now called United We Stand, and we're talking about racial reconciliation. And I think this discussion on immersion points and paints a beautiful picture of something that's important for us as God's people. See, John Perkins says this, justice is something for which every generation has to strive. Let me read that one more time. Justice is something for which every generation has to strive. I think he's right, and this is why. When we look at our parents, or their parents, or their parents' generation, the issue of race and injustice uh, and that they dealt with, we're looking in from the outside. See what I'm getting at here? That's easy work, to look from the outside of the bowl and tell the fish that they're swimming in a particular immersion. The hard part's for us, who are swimming in the bowl and have to figure out what prejudices we're swimming in unknowingly. We need someone outside the bowl to help us see the immersion we're swimming in more clearly. And I think that person is Jesus. In our passage today, we meet a character who's swimming in his own immersion. Uh, Like he so often does, Jesus kind of has to shock the system to wake him up from his own paradigm to help him understand the paradigm that Jesus so desires to introduce him to, the kingdom of God. So again, if you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37, a familiar passage. We're gonna read this together. It says this, and behold, a lawyer. Now, I wanna stop really quickly there and just remind you that this guy's in the story. Sometimes when we read the parable of the Good Samaritan, we forget there's a lawyer at the front end, but this whole thing is about Jesus educating this guy. Okay, so don't forget the lawyer. So, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what's written in the law? How do you read it? So the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him pass, or he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? Remember, that question is for the lawyer. And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Friends, although this story is certainly about the importance of showing kindness to the marginalized and to the broken, I don't believe that's the primary aim of Jesus here. I think he has something else in mind. Though I will say this, parables are beautiful in that They're multi-layered and faceted. You can pull so many things from them because the one who gave them to us is God, right? But I wanna get at what I think Jesus is aiming at this morning. We begin with a Jewish lawyer interrogating Jesus. And make no mistake, that's what he's doing here. If he's a lawyer, he's good at it. And he says, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? No, this question isn't asked out of curiosity or spiritual desperation. He's testing Jesus, which gives us some clue to his tone, the intention behind it. 
And so often, as, he, as Jesus so often did, he meets the man's question with a question. He won't allow the man to dictate where things are going to go because Jesus knows where they need to go. So Jesus says to him, what's written in the law? And how do you read it? Basically, answer the question, and I'll, I'll see how you do, how close you are to the truth. So the law you're answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But the lawyer wants to justify himself, and he presses. And when he presses, he asks the question, so who is my neighbor? Why would he ask this? Well, because he wants Jesus to tell him he's awesome. He wants Jesus to justify him, right, his greatness. He feels like the conversation is pointing towards how good a man he is, and then Jesus flips the script. Jesus is smart. There is a, mo a movement, and I thought I was thinking about this this week, there's a movement in jiu-jitsu called Kuzushi, you gotta say that with me. Kuzushi, it's fun to say. And in this movement, basically what happens is someone takes the momentum of an opponent and uses that momentum against the opponent to move them into or maneuver them into their own movement, uh, whether it's a pin or a kick or a punch to the face or whatever that thing is that's coming in that moment. This is what Kuzushi is. It's taking someone's momentum and using it against them. And guess what, Jesus is using Kuzushi here with this guy. The guy thinks that the momentum is headed in one direction in this particular moment, and Jesus is like a verbal jujitsu ninja, and he flips it on him. It's amazing, you'll see this as we continue forward. So let's look at the parable as Jesus uh, maneuvers this conversation the direction that it ought to go. Here's the deal, you have, uh, to recap the parable, you have a man who falls in among robbers, they beat him and almost kill him. You have a priest and Levite who could stop and help him but they choose not to for whatever reason, we're not exactly sure. But then you have a Samaritan who stops, takes care of the man, puts him on his, his animal, takes him to an inn and then in the most crazy moment says, whatever it costs from here on out, I'm gonna leave but when I come back, I'll take care of it. That's the parable in a nutshell. So here's the deal, Jesus' first move in the process of taking this guy's momentum and switching direction with it is to disturb homeostasis. Another way of saying it is, is to shock this guy's pants off, okay? See, the characters in the story are meant to disturb the lawyer. They're meant to bother him to the core, to wake him from a slumber. It's the equivalent of telling a story where Superman is the bad guy and Lex Luthor is the hero. The priests and the Levite were revered for their goodness and godliness. It's not like our day when you look at clergy and you think uh, with suspicion or maybe judgmentalism or any other number of things. In those days, these guys were at the top of the heap edu in, in education, in leadership. They were the ones in society that these Jews would have revered above all else. And yet they don't stop, they keep going. This treatment of the priests and Levites is meant to disturb the lawyer, to bother him to the, to the core. It's meant to shock him. And then Jesus takes it a step further. Jesus paints the Samaritan as the hero of the story. This would have made the lawyer's skin crawl. In his head, the Samaritans were treacherous traitors. They were the equivalent of mudbloods in the Harry Potter universe. They were looked down upon by the Jews. See, the lawyer was immersed in a narrative of prejudice that had been forged before the day, in fact, not just before the day he was born, but long before the day when he was born. He had no idea what he was dealing with. See, that's some Bible history for you. Back in 722 BC, right, so this is 700 plus years before this day when Jesus is talking with this guy, the Assyrian Empire invades Samaria. Now, Samaria is a ruling city in northern, of the northern kingdom of Israel. So just to give you some, some Bible background, you've got Israel and Judea, which have sort of separated at this point in the history of the Jewish people. So the Assyrians invade, and they take the people who live in that Samaria area, Samaria area, apologize for that, and they disperse them all over their kingdom. 
And, and it's a very cruel move, right? But it's strategic, right? On one hand, I'm just doing research this week, part of the reasons why the Assyrians did this kind of stuff is they wanted to move technology around their kingdom. Part of the reason was they didn't want rebellion, so they made people leave the place they were from so there was a lower chance of rebellion. And there's other reasons attached to it as well, but at the end of the day, it's a cruel move. So you have all these Jews who are dispersed across the Assyrian Empire, but there's a few who stay. There's a few that they allow to leave. And this is where it gets a little fuzzy, but it's important to our story today. Some scholars think that from there, the Assyrian Empire, which was known for its cruelty, intentionally forced intermarriage between Jews and Assyrians, thus producing children that were both Jewish and Assyrians. These are the Samaritans. Other scholars believe that Jewish men and women willfully intermarried with the Assyrian people as they settled in their newly conquered land. We don't know exactly. But either way, from here, the Samaritan people altered worship practices and sacred locations, and the divide grew deeper and deeper and deeper between these two groups, leading to more and more prejudice from one towards the other. The Samaritans were born in this historical moment, and the Jews hated them for literally hundreds of years leading up to this moment where Jesus is talking to a Jewish lawyer about Samaritans. And so the reason I share that with you, to say that a Samaritan acting as the hero rather than the priest or the Levite would have been scandalous to the Jewish lawyer. He would have thought, like, the Samaritans don't act that way. And this is important. That would have been completely normal to think that. It wouldn't have been out of the ordinary because everyone thought that. Remember that immersion, that fishbowl thing. So what Jesus is doing here is he's disturbing homeostasis for this guy. He's shocking him, he's shocking the system to wake him up to his own prejudice. And I think he does a pretty good job. But from there, he moves from this moment of like awakening to a moment of convicting. That's the next move that Jesus accomplishes here. See, from here, Jesus goes about painting the perfect picture of neighborliness but it's not the priest and the Levite, it's the Samaritan who live out that perfect picture of neighborliness. See, one of the things I love about this passage, when you go back up, again, this is the beauty of reading through the New Testament and studying it and kind of digging in. If you get up back in that passage again, when he's talking about the way that you can be sort of a blessed or godly man, he says that you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, y'all, the word for love there is agape, and many of us know that word, but it's not phileo, brotherly love. It's not eros, or that sensual kind of love. It's agape, that's the word he's using, and guess what, in the story, there's only one character who acts with sacrificial, gracious love, and it's not the priest and Levite, it's the Samaritan. It's that guy. Verse 34 says, he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. That's what love looks like. That's what agape love looks like. See, Jesus finishes his story and looks at the lawyer and he says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? So the moment of conviction. This is why I think this passage is ultimately about Jesus pointing out the prejudice in this man. If Jesus was looking to make a statement simply about compassion and kindness, he wouldn't have concluded this way. He would have asked, now, do you see how to be a good neighbor? That would be an easy answer. It would also allow the lawyer to remain safely in his own fishbowl, but Jesus wouldn't allow it. He had to wake him up, so he didn't ask that. Jesus seems just as interested in convicting the lawyer to be a neighbor as he is to help this man redefine who his neighbor is. See, before Jesus can redefine how to be a neighbor, he has to wake him up to his own prejudice and lack of neighborliness. Remember, the question is, who is my neighbor? Let me point this out too. It's not that Jesus had only had 
positive experiences with Samaritan people. Now, if you go to John chapter 4, Jesus has this moment with a woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, powerful passage, uh, and that one actually turns out great. She goes back and tells her people about Jesus. They put their faith in him. It's actually quite beautiful, and that's one instance, but take note that just one chapter earlier than our passage today, Jesus is utterly rejected by a Samaritan uh, village for the fact that he was headed towards Jerusalem. See, the Samaritans had their own prejudices as well. They weren't immune. They were likely just as prejudiced as the Jews. They hated the Jews just as much as the Jews hated them. It's just that Jesus refused to have any part of it. It's not that all of his interactions with Samaritans had been positive. He had just refused to be a part of that hateful narrative. This is important for us. There's something powerful there for us to learn about not taking the hate bait that's thrown out to us and choosing instead to work towards reconciliation. Y'all, we're Christians. At the end of the day, Jesus is our example. And there's no place among us for racial or ethnic prejudice. There's just not. It just doesn't work out. You're not following Jesus if that's a part of your ethos. And so we work towards reconciliation. We've been given what the Bible says, the ministry of reconciliation. That's what Jesus does, and we follow him in that. So again, Jesus responds. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And here's the answer from the lawyer. You guys, listen closely to this. He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Friends, you notice anything about his answer? Does anything about it stand out and make you think, huh? Well, here's one thing. Did you notice that he couldn't say Samaritan that he said, the one, that he couldn't follow up with, it was the Samaritan. See, that is the, the, the words of a guy who is grappling with his own immersion, right? He's feeling the conviction of his own prejudice, right? So he wasn't able to articulate the Samaritan, but make no mistake, his answer is an admission of a heart under conviction. See, Jesus has taken him full circle now. What starts as an interrogation and an appeal for justification ends with conviction and a, co- and a commission. A man who begins the conversation arrogant and self-righteous ends the conversation humbled and feeling conviction. Y'all, Jesus is amazing, isn't he? Amazing. So where does that leave us today? I think that's the big question. What can we do in response to this passage? Well, I believe that we need to come to terms with our own prejudices. And I mention that because I don't think we see a lot of them, many of which we can't see ourselves. So we pray and we ask God to make them known. We need someone outside the fishbowl to look in for us and show us. And listen, this isn't just for one group in the room. This is for all of us. We all possess these prejudices that we either have borrowed from our growing up, our families, or maybe we formed over time. But I think God wants to deal with them. He wants to shock the system, to disturb homeostasis and pull us out of them. I think one way we do this is that we pray prayers like King David. Listen to this prayer from him, Psalm 139, 23 through 24. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart, Try me, as in like a trial or a test, and know my thoughts, and see if there's any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So in a culture that says, don't judge me, we say, God, judge me, please, because I can't see the peripheral. I can't see my own immersion. I don't know what I'm swimming in that I'm not supposed to. I don't have the wisdom to understand life like you do, so I need you to look in on my life. I need you to put my life on trial and tell me what's up, tell me what's wrong, and tell me what's right so that I can follow you more closely. See, Christians have the humility of saying, I don't know it all. My perspective's not the perspective, but he's got the perspective, and I wanna get under that perspective and be the person he's called me to be. That's what it's about here, y'all. 
It's about Jesus looking in on our fishbowl and saying, that's the thing. And so we pray, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Y'all, as the Spirit leads or reveals, we choose humility in the face of conviction. We repent and we follow Jesus. That's the way of the Christian. So based on our parable today, I wanna give you a few things to reflect on. Um, I'm gonna give you some space to deal with God and identify and navigate through some of this stuff. So here's all I want us to do. We're gonna do like a little exercise. It'll take two or three minutes. But I don't wanna just preach a sermon and not give you the opportunity in this moment to sit with God and allow him to speak to you. Allow him to convict and persuade the way that he does so much better than I can with my words. So if we could, all across the room, let's just put ourselves in a posture of prayer. If everybody could, just close your eyes. You don't have to bow your head. You, just whatever gets you in a position where you can talk to God, okay? And what I wanna use is just some of the stuff from the story to point out perhaps some prejudice that might be in our hearts or in our lives and then allow the Holy Spirit to speak, all right? So let's do this together. If you find it difficult to imagine that someone of a particular race or ethnicity can act morally or with great compassion and altruism, you might have a problem. The question is, do you find that in your heart? And you guys do that work now. Okay, the next question. If you find it difficult to imagine that someone of a particular race or ethnicity can be the moral hero of the story, or if it bothers you that they are, you might be in trouble. Do you find that in your heart? Next question. If your view of a race or ethnicity keeps you from being able to purely praise someone's good works as good works, you might have a problem. Do you find that anywhere in your heart? And then finally, if you participate with a group of people that systemically despise a particular race or ethnicity, again, you might have a problem. And do you find that in your heart or in your life? This morning as you pray, if the Holy Spirit identifies it, confess it, repent of it, and follow Jesus. Father, like David, we pray, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. You guys can raise your heads. I just want to give you one word of conclusion. I believe we all carry prejudices in our hearts that need to be dealt with by our creator, every single one of us. They're not, not all racial and ethnic, but we all carry them. And dealing with prejudice is a part of growing up and maturing in our faith. So hear this today. If you find yourself in a place of prejudice or hate or brokenness today, God wants to heal all of that in you. Believe that. And in case you haven't noticed or put two and two together, in a world that cancels those who sin against their ideologies, we serve a God who died for those people. He doesn't cancel them. He offers them grace. He offers grace to sinners like the prejudiced lawyer 
who came to put him on trial. You guys see that, how beautiful that is? That's why I love Jesus so much. So today, if you sense that you're far from God, if if you're a sinner and you need grace, God's here to forgive you of whatever that is, to save you from your sin and give you a new life with him. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God, if, if you don't know Jesus, if you feel like I'm way too far gone, Kirk, let me tell you that Jesus died for every single one of us, no matter how far we are away. And like the story of the prodigal son, he welcomes you home. And so today, if that's you and you're here and you're like, Kirk, I just need to come home. I'm a sinner and I need the grace of God. I need a relationship with Jesus. I just wanna invite you to make this day the day when you come home to the Lord. On the screen behind me or on the screens, you'll see uh, an opportunity. If you're that person and you, you need to, to put your faith in Jesus, we want you to do this. There's a, there's a number on the screen and we just want you to text no Jesus to that number so that we can follow up with you. And here's my encouragement. Don't wait until later today to do that. Do it right now. If that's you and you need a relationship with God, don't wait three hours till you're watching football on TV and you forget. If God's convicting you, let this be the moment that you respond so that we don't distract ourselves to death and miss out on the most important thing. So today, if that's you, would you text that? No Jesus to that particular number. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today and we confess that we can't see it all, particularly in ourselves. Lord, there's sin in our life. There's prejudice in our heart, Lord, that we're not even aware of at this moment. Or maybe we've become aware of it in just the, the last few minutes but we wanna hold on to it. And Lord, we just pray that you would sever that from us. You'd burn it away so that we can be more like Jesus. Lord, we wanna be like the good Samaritan, not have prejudice towards the Samaritan, like the lawyer in this story. So God, would you help us? Help us to see, search our hearts. Lord, put us on trial and point out those things in us. And God, here's the beauty of it. Lord, we want that because we know that as you convict us, that you won't put us away, that you'll restore us with your grace and make us more like you. Lord, that's why we trust you when we say search our hearts and test us, because we know it's ultimately for our good and for the good of the kingdom of God. So God, do that for us today, we pray. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to this week's sermon here at Houston Northwest Church. Our vision is to make Houston more like heaven by helping Houstonians like me and you become more like Jesus. Now, if you have any questions about following Jesus or you made a decision today to give your life to him, please let us know. Text no Jesus to 281-946-6500. Connect with us throughout the week at hnw.org. And again, thanks for listening. Enjoy the rest of your day and we cannot wait to see you again next time. Peace.